and welcome again to my videos for Physical Chemistry 1. When we last met, we walked through the derivation of these two equations by starting with Routh's Law and Dalton's Law of Partial Pressures. As I mentioned then, these two equations are significant because they give us some insight into the process of distillation and can help us improve our distillation technique and make our distillation yield higher and of a higher purity. Before we begin today, let's look at these two equations again and remind ourselves of some of their important features. These equations tell us how the overall vapor pressure above a binary solution is related to the mole fraction of one of the components, A. One equation ties the pressure to the mole fraction of A in the liquid, and one ties P to the mole fraction of A in the vapor. But the most important thing about these two equations, and the thing that makes them so useful, is that the mole fraction is the only variable on the right sides of the equations. Everything else in each equation is the vapor pressure of a pure sample of either A or B. The vapor pressure of a pure sample is a constant at any particular temperature, so everything but the mole fraction is a constant on the right sides of the equation. That means it's easy to figure out how the pressure varies as the mole fraction changes. And we can plot the pressure based on the mole fraction in either the liquid or gas phases. Let's try it. Suppose we have a binary mixture of ethanol and water. I'll put the overall vapor pressure on the y-axis and the mole fraction of ethanol on the x-axis. At 25.0 degrees Celsius, the vapor pressure of pure water is 0.0317 bars. That's the situation when there's no ethanol around, so the total vapor pressure is 0.0317 bars when the mole fraction of ethanol is zero. Meanwhile, the vapor pressure of pure ethanol is 0.0787 bars. So that's the vapor pressure when the mole fraction of ethanol is one. Now let's plot our two equations. If we plot this one, here's the curve we get. Remember, this equation is the one that uses the mole fraction of ethanol in the liquid. So what does this tell us? Well, suppose we have a mole fraction of 0.5 for our ethanol in the liquid. The curve tells us that at this mole fraction, the total vapor pressure above the liquid is 0.0552 bars. If we try to raise the vapor pressure to say 0.06 bars without changing the temperature or the mole fraction, we find that it can't be done. At that pressure, all the vapor will immediately recondense into a liquid. Now let's plot the second of our equations. This equation is the one that uses the mole fraction of ethanol in the vapor above the solution. What does this one tell us? Again, suppose we have a mole fraction of 0.5 for our ethanol in the vapor. The curve tells us that at that mole fraction, the total vapor pressure above the liquid is 0.0452 bars. If we try to lower the vapor pressure, to say 0.03 bars, without changing the temperature or the mole fraction, we find that it can't be done. At that pressure, any liquid immediately vaporizes. So below this curve, only vapor is present. For that reason, this curve is called the vapor curve. And above the other curve, only liquid is present. That curve is called the liquidus curve. But the really interesting part of this graph is the area between the two curves. At this temperature, both the liquid and vapor phases are present at those pressures. That's what happens while a solution is boiling. So when our liquid is boiling, the system is located somewhere in this region of the graph. So suppose we have a situation where the mole fraction of ethanol is 0.5 and the vapor pressure above the solution is 0 0.050 bars. That would put our system at this position on the graph. Because it's in between the two curves, we can see that the solution would be boiling under these conditions. If these were the conditions that arose during a distillation, we might want to know how much of the ethanol is in the liquid phase and how much is a vapor. 
using this graph, we can figure that out. We'll draw a point on the graph where our system is currently located and call it P. Now we'll draw a horizontal line through that point from the liquidus curve to the vapor curve. We'll label the point where the line crosses the liquidus curve, L, and the point where it crosses the vapor curve, V. This horizontal line is called a tie line. It turns out that the relative amount of ethanol in the liquid phase versus the vapor phase is given by the ratio of the distance between points P and V over the distance between P and L. In our sample, the point L occurs where the mole fraction of ethanol in the liquid phase is 0 0.3895, and the point V is where the mole fraction in the vapor phase is 0 0.6131. If we plug those into the equation for the ratio of moles, we find out that the ratio is 1.023. So that tells us that there are slightly more moles of ethanol in the liquid phase than in the vapor phase. We just use the length of the horizontal line between the two phases in this phase plot in order to determine the relative amounts of one of the components in the liquid and vapor phases. The equation we used in order to do this is known as the lever rule. The previous example was interesting, but it only has limited practical value. Why? Well, remember that the y-axis was the total vapor pressure. That's not a very easy thing to measure. In a practical experiment like a distillation, we don't have the pressure changing at a constant temperature. Instead, the opposite is true. We have the overall pressure constant, and it's the temperature that we're changing. Let's try using a plot where that's the case. For example, let's look at a binary solution of pentane and octane. I'll plot the mole fraction of octane on the x-axis. And this time, we'll put temperature on the y-axis instead of the pressure. The plot will still show us the division between where the system is a vapor and where it's a liquid. For a pure substance, the border between a liquid and vapor occurs at the boiling point. When the mole fraction of octane is zero, we have a pure sample of pentane, and pentane's boiling point is 36.0 degrees Celsius, so we can put that point on our plot. Meanwhile, when the mole fraction of octane is 1, we have pure octane, and its boiling point is 125.6 degrees. We now plot the liquidus and vapor curves for this system, and here's what we get. As you'd expect, we have a vapor at higher temperatures and a liquid at lower temperatures. But notice that this is the opposite of what we got on the previous plot. When we had pressure on the y-axis, we had liquids at higher pressures near the top of the plot and vapor at lower pressures. Anyway, back to the plot with temperature on the y-axis. Once again, the really interesting part of this graph is in the middle, where both the liquid and vapor phases coexist. Unlike a pure substance, when we have two substances mixed together, the resulting solution can boil over a range of temperatures. That's what happens during a distillation. Unlike what would occur for a pure substance, the solution in a distillation begins boiling at one temperature, and we can continue to increase the temperature even if the boiling hasn't completed yet. That's not the case for a pure substance. For a pure substance, the temperature doesn't continue to increase until the boiling process has completed. But remember the lever rule. Using this plot, the lever rule can tell us how to perform a distillation that will give us a better, more pure distillate. Here's how. Suppose we have a solution of pentane and octane containing a mole fraction of octane of 0 0.3. We start at just 30 degrees Celsius, which puts our system here. We slowly raise the temperature so our system moves vertically on the plot. Eventually, the system reaches the liquidus curve. At this point, the more volatile of the two components begins to boil. In our case, that's the pentane. 
The lever rule tells us that the ratio of octane in the liquid phase versus the vapor phase is given by this equation. In this case, the point L is here, and the point V is here. The distance between points P and V is large, and between P and L is nearly zero. That tells us that the ratio is very large, which means the amount of octane in the liquid phase is also very large. In other words, the vapor at this point contains almost no octane. The octane remains in the liquid state. Instead, the vapor is almost 100% pentane. So the distillate dripping out of our apparatus will be nearly pure pentane. That's exactly what we want from a good distillation. But remember, the solution can boil when the system is anywhere in this region. Therefore, if we raise the temperature of our apparatus very quickly, the system will move vertically into the central region. If we do that, the lever rule tells us that there will be a noticeable amount of octane in both the liquid and vapor phases. So this tells us that if the system is in that location on the plot, there will be both pentane and octane in the vapor, so the distillate coming from the apparatus will contain both of them. That's not what we want. It would mean that our distillation would be contaminated by the second of our two components. So the upshot of this is that our distillation will be better if we can keep the system right at the liquidus curve, because at that point only the more volatile component will enter the vapor phase. But wait, it's not quite as simple as that. Remember, the x-axis here is the mole fraction of octane. As we saw earlier, if we raise the temperature until the system reaches the liquidus curve, the pentane begins to boil off. But that means that the mole fraction of octane will increase. So the system moves slightly to the right on this plot. And that means the boiling would stop. To begin the boiling again, we'd need to raise the temperature until we reach the curve again. That process would continue. Whenever we reach the curve, the pentane will begin to boil off, which moves the system to the right, and that means we'd need to raise the temperature again in order to continue the boiling process. But remember, we don't want to raise the temperature so much that the system enters this region, because in that case, both components of the system would be partially vaporized, so the distillate would contain both components. So this tells us that the distillation would give us the best results if we raise the temperature very slowly once boiling has begun. That way, the system will move along the liquidus curve, and only the more volatile component will be in the distillate. Eventually, the less volatile component will be the only component remaining in the solution. And at that point, that's the component that would begin to boil and would be the only component in the distillate. Well, that's enough new material for now. I hope you've learned some useful tips for your next distillation. When we meet again, we'll talk more about colligative properties. You might recall that in video 34, we said that Raut's law describes one colligative property, the lowering of the vapor pressure when we add a solute to a liquid. In the next two videos, we'll see that colligative properties can help us identify the solute in a solution. It's one of the most practical applications of colligative properties we can use in a chemistry lab. I hope you'll join me for that. But until then, have a good week.